Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 12059 Conveyancing. This is week one in 2018. We have a number of people online. Thank you very much all for joining. Please unmute your microphone to ask a question. I'd encourage that or to make a statement. Um, I encourage some online discussion through the Zoom sessions that we have each week and of course through the UCRU facility. And I'll introduce those things to you um, as we progress. So, conveyancing. Now, have your friends or colleagues said to you when you've said, I'm studying conveyancing, or something to the effect, oh, that sounds a bit boring. Their eyes might glaze over and think, oh, it's a bit dull. Why'd you choose conveyancing? Well, I've got to, I must confess that when I first started my legal career in terms of work, 1982, at one of the largest law firms in Queensland, I had requested of the five divisions that the law firm had for my two years of articles to be placed into litigation. When I was allocated property, I must confess I was a bit disappointed and I thought, oh, boring property. I just want to let you know what happened for my first settlement. Now, this is week one. So I've already completed five or six years of study. Back in those days, in order to be um, admitted as a solicitor, one would generally, almost everyone completed what was called articles of clerkship. And in my case, the articles went for two years. Some went for five, but mine went for two years. So I roll up in my chocolate brown suit, which was all the rage in the early 80s. Don't wear a chocolate brown suit when you go into court. If you're wearing a court, if you're going to court, wear um, dark blue, male or female, as a coat or a suit. Um, but back in those days, I had my chocolate brown suit and I rolled up and I was put into the property section. One of the junior solicitors came to me, I think on the first or second day that I was there and said something to the effect, I want you now to effect a settlement. Now, back in those days, prior to the decision of law and evidence, we weren't entirely sure what was meant by the term time of the essence. You'll hear that a lot in conveyancing. Time is of the essence of the contract. Now, we took time of the essence to mean literally the time nominated for settlement. So my first task was to attend a settlement at 3 p.m. And I was given a memo, which was all the rage back then, saying, please attend the settlement. The settlement is at this location. You're acting for the buyer. Here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to take. Here's what I want you to bring back. And remember, and this was in bold, Time is of the essence. Do not be late, even by a minute. That was all literally what it said, all in bold. I was keyed up, ready to go. The problem is that the clerk in the firm, whose job it was to receive the check, the bank check that I needed for, to affect this settlement, was for reasons not his or her fault, slow in getting the check back to us. So I was perched by the lift, and it was one of the high-rise um, uh, law firms in Brisbane, and it was getting very late, um, and I knew that I had to collect this cheque, take the cheque, the file, to the settlement, which was on the other side of town, and I had to be there not later than 3pm. It was then like a relay, you know, where you put the hand out, you receive the bat, and then you run. It was like that. The clerk came up out of the lift. There was no talk. I snatched the check, took the lift straight back down, and I hit the road. Now, back in those days, I was pretty fit. I was pretty strong, and I was playing a lot of football. So I could run, and I could dodge, and I could palm people off if I had to. And I did all of those things in order to get to the settlement by 3 o'clock. And I ran the opposite end of town, and I got there one minute to 3 o'clock, wiped the sweat from the brow because it was pretty hot in um, summer in Queensland. And I then uh, opened the file to affect the settlement. The problem is that the check was not there. The bank check that I'd been waiting for that I collected as part of this relay was not in the file. I know now that what I did was I collected the check, threw it into the file and I ran with the file under my arm the check had actually slipped out onto the pavement in Queen Street. So not only was I unable to affect the settlement, but also I had lost a bank check. 
I then went into damage control. I phoned the solicitor that contacted me. Back in those days, it was not mobile phone. It was not even digital phone. It was the dial-ups. So can you imagine how long that seems to take? Three, three, six, and so on. Finally got through, calls were made, someone had picked up the check, and fortunately for me, taken it back to the bank. So we were able to make alternate arrangements. I collected the check. I was doing a lot of running that day, went back to the settlement, and we affected the settlement by four o'clock. And in the end, everything was okay. But I thought, man, what I've learned is that in law, there's more to just knowing the law and knowing the process you need to take proactive steps to ensure that things don't go wrong. As a result of that experience of my very first settlement in my first week as an article clerk in 1982, ever since then, any file that I opened has an envelope stapled to the inside and anything that is needed um, for settlement or whatever is placed in that envelope and placed with some sort of um, bulldog clip. So that never happened again. But I thought this conveyancing stuff, it's a little more exciting than I realised because things can go wrong. Now that was my first settlement. That was in my first week. I want to tell you about my first conveyancing file. Now just by way of background for those that were a bit late, I'm talking about my articles of clerkship. I was placed in a large firm um, I wanted to go into litigation, but they put me into property. I thought that would be boring. Anyway, this is what happened. Rachel knows the problem. You, you must have heard this, me say this in um, Introduction to Law, Rachel. Um, so what happened in my first settlement was this. I acted for a buyer and everything was going smoothly. On the day of settlement, the buyer said something to the effect I wish to conduct an inspection of the property pre-settlement. I checked the contract. I could see that you're entitled to do that. The buyer did in fact check the property and phoned me shortly before settlement, say an hour before settlement, and said, I've done the inspection and there is a large caravan in the backyard of the property. What happens if it's still there at settlement? I checked the contract came to a preliminary view, ran it by one of the partners in the law firm who agreed with what I had proposed. I contacted the client by telephone shortly before settlement was due to be affected and said, any property which is left on the site at the time of settlement is deemed under the contract to be abandoned and becomes your property. I was under strict instructions to contact my client who was at this stage sitting outside the property or nearby rather, um, and advised the client of settlement. The client had secured the keys, immediately secured the property, went inside and towed the caravan out, all within half an hour of settlement. This is an expensive caravan. Towed it away, his um, partner's father was a caravan dealer. So he was able to dispose of that caravan quickly. Now all hell broke out because the owners of the property came back to collect their caravan that afternoon. It wasn't there. They were saying it's theft, it's fraud, it's blah, 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 whatever. And in the end, nothing happened. Other than my client kept the proceeds of the sale of this expensive caravan that was never part of the deal. So that was in the contract. So you can understand that my thoughts about being in this boring property section after my first settlement and my first conveyance were that this conveyancing is pretty exciting. I'm pretty, I like this conveyancing. Lots of things can happen. It taught me a few things. The first is, as I mentioned before, you need to be proactive in terms of ensuring that any risk of something going wrong is minimised. Secondly, you need to know the terms of the contract. Now, ever since then, primarily, I, I, I did some conveyancing for a while, but ever since then, when I was working as a solicitor up until a few years ago, when people would come to me with a conveyancing problem, have a guess what my first response almost invariably was 
to a question asked of me in relation to a conveyancing issue. Bearing in mind my experience of what I did for my first conveyance. What do you think? Okay, now looking at the chat facility, check the contract, what's in the contract exactly. So what do we take from that when it comes to answering any question in relation to conveyancing in this unit, particularly um, at the end of the, um, at the term, when we have our take home exam? Check the contract first. If you miss something that's in the contract, then you will be marked down quite severely because I'm giving you plenty of warning that you need to check the contract. And why is the contract important in a conveyancing course? Well, property law is, sorry, conveyancing, is that lovely hybrid of contract law, property law, and equity. All of these things come into play. So you need to understand all of these issues. Okay, CSI conveyancing, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so that's where I think conveyancing is really exciting. I like conveyancing, and this sounds a bit odd, but I'm a barrister now, and what I, I like conveyancing when things go wrong. You can always tell the conveyancer in a group of people, when there's a hundred people and something goes wrong, the conveyancer, or no, the, the barrister, the bar, you can always tell the barrister because the barrister sort of smiles and looks up interestingly. Um, all right, now, do we all know how to use Moodle and we all know how to use Ucrew? For those of you that haven't worked with me before, Ucrew might be a very strange thing. Have we all had a look at Ucrew? As we speak, I'll just log on. But um, Ucrew is where we, okay, so, so some haven't used Ucrew. Um, it's very simple to get to Ucrew. All you need to do is to log on to Moodle and where you followed the link to join this session, I think from memory, but immediately below it is a link to join the Ucrew discussion. You should already be pre-registered. It should just be a matter of clicking on the link and joining the discussion. So anything that you need to ask me by way of a question, you should ask through Ucrew. You can send me an email and I'll provide you with a response but more than likely I'll provide a, a request at the end of it saying something to the effect great question please ask on Ucrew I'll repeat the answer. Ucrew is also on your opportunity to introduce material. Now I know that there are going to be people doing this unit who are actually working in conveyancing and I'm not so if you have something to add to value add I encourage you to do so and please use Ucrew to do that. It's very simple. I don't use Facebook, but people tell me it's like Facebook. Is anyone able, is anyone able, uh, can say that they've used Ucrew, they know how to use it, they're happy to help people? Okay, Sarah's used Ucrew. Others have used it, yes? Okay. All right, <clears throat> it's pretty straightforward, I hope. So if you haven't followed the link, please do so now because that will be the main part of our interaction. On Moodle, I would ask you to complete answers to the weekly problems and upload them in perhaps a familiar style where you upload your response to weekly problems. But in terms of any discussion, please use Ucrew in that sense. Now this unit is practically orientated. My aim is to make this academic to a degree, but with a practical emphasis. So let's think, how do we make sure the check does not fly out onto the pavement in Queen Street? How do we make sure that our client does not lose a caravan as a result of acting for them in a conveyance? Things like that. And as a result of the practical nature of this unit, the Legal Practitioners Board of Queensland provides it with accreditation. So we need to ensure that we have that practical emphasis. Um, we have a take home examination for this unit and that's worth how much? Can someone remind me? It's a bit of a test to see if you've read the assessment regime. Who knows what the take home examination is worth in works 
in 50%. Oh, we've got lots of answers, correct answers there. All right, so you won't know the take-home examination just yet, but you'll know when it's on. Can anyone tell me when I will release the take-home exam? It gives me a chance to have a cup of tea if I ask you a question. You can unmute your microphone if you like. 4th of October is one bid. The 5th of October is others. 4th of October is another. So when do I release it and when's it due? This is getting you to check. Due on the 5th. I think that's right, says Rachel. So I think I'd probably release it on the 4th. There you go. Thank you, Andrea. Released on the 4th of October, due on the 5th of October. So in the spirit of ensuring that we don't drop the check on the pavement, what are we now going to do in terms of our diaries for the, 5th, the 4th and the 5th of October? Can anyone tell me? It's a loaded question. There's only one right answer. We're going to book out that diary so that we can do this conveyancing exam at that time. All right. Um, put it in the diary. Okay, so we'll do that now. Make sure that we're free, fit, ready to go for the take-home exam. When you do your take-home exam or any examinations through the university, I'm going to ask you to pay particular attention to what is typically the first word in the exam. You'll think, what's the significance of the first word? Well, when you do an examination, there are usually one of five first words, and they all mean something different. The first is the word interpret. The second is the word analyze. The third is the word evaluate. The fourth is the word infer. And the fifth is the word explain. Do we all know the difference between that? What, what is the examiner asking you to do if they want you to interpret, analyze, evaluate, infer, or explain? Because they're slightly different. I say that because if I ask a question using one of those words at the start, I will be looking for you to provide a particular methodology in your answer. Interpretation means your ability to determine the material facts. Analyze is your ability to identify hidden features. Evaluation is your ability to assess Inference is your ability to draw conclusions and explanation is your ability to communicate results. All good? All right, keep an eye out for that. Now we know that this is a 12 week unit. The textbook is the excellent text, Land Contracts in Australia by really well known people within the property sphere in Queensland. This is a great text, the only criticism is it's a little out of date and it doesn't take long to become out of date for conveyancing. So the reference to the REIQ contract I think is the 11th edition and we're about to go into, is it the 15th? Right, so you need to make that allowance. What we've tried to do is match the materials in Moodle and the study guides with the text so there will be that lag of about two years. We will provide you with information to bridge that gap as best we can, but we thought it would be confusing if we were talking the current contract on Moodle and the study guides, as opposed to the 11th edition, for example, in the textbook. So we've staying, we're staying with the textbook, but when you answer a question, try if possible to answer it based on the current version of the contracts. So what are these 15th edition as from the 1st of July? Yes, thank you, Sarah. Um, so what are these contracts that I'm talking about? What are these, if you like, standard contracts for conveyancing in Queensland? Who puts them out? Who says that these are the standards that we should use? You can unmute your microphone or use the chat facility. REIQ, REIQ. We call it the REIQ contract generally, but for houses and land, for dwellings, most of them, they're actually a joint effort. 
who's the other party that is involved in this joint? The Law Society, QLS, great. Okay, so if you want information about the contracts, up-to-date information, it's very useful to consider going to the REIQ website. It's useful to go to the Queensland Law Society website and we'll look at those shortly. But before we do, in the spirit of looking at what we want to achieve and working back in order to achieve it, let's look at the assessment regime for this unit. I've given you all the advice that I plan to give you in relation to the take home exam, at least for tonight. But each week I'll give you some little hint that will help you to progressively work towards having a great result in your take home exam. Now we've only got a small group here in this unit and let me say that I'm not afraid to give really good marks. I'm not afraid to give really bad marks either. Um, and there is nothing, no such thing as far as I'm concerned as a bell curve. So don't think that there's only two of you that can get high distinctions. I don't know, how many have we got in this unit? It's only like 23 or 25 or something or 30. It's really small. So let's, get, let's aim for 30 HDs. We can do that. Um, in terms of the assessment regime, who knows the date for the first assessment? What day is it due? Twenty-three August. Thank you. And what happens if you lodge it on the twenty-fifth of August and you don't have an extension? You lose five percent per day. Yes, you'll lose ten percent. What happens if you try to lodge it on Sunday, the second of September? This may not be the case with all units. You know, you yep, you won't. Won't accept it. Zero, zero, wipeout. Wipeout, says Rachel. I agree with that. That's it. Okay, so you're duly warned. Then part of the reason that I do include a very firm last day for submission of work is I want to do the right thing in providing you with good quality feedback at a reasonable time. So I can't wait for one person who's late by three or four weeks to submit work I want to make sure that everyone submitted their work. There is a cutoff, but I know in a small group dedicated like we are, everybody's going to put their work in and you'll do it on time, in which case I can try and provide the feedback even quicker than I normally would. Now we've all read the first assessment. We know what it's all about. Let me share the screen. I'll attempt to share the screen so that I can um, talk about that. And of course, I'm having trouble actually finding it. I think this is it. So please let me know if you are now looking at the first assessment piece. It should be the mock proctor article. So what's proctor? Who knows what proctor is? Queensland Law Society magazine. All right, thank you. And um, the idea of this legal publication is that it's designed to be read primarily by lawyers. So in asking you to prepare this mock proctor article, I'm asking you to write to an educated audience, but not necessarily an audience that deals with conveyancing. You know, an interesting thing in the reading is that um, there are many times where solicitors provide evidence as experts in court proceedings about the law but that's pretty much exclusively for conveyancing. Now, the practical reason for that is that many judges come from the ranks of barristers, many of whom who have not practiced as solicitors, so they're not specifically aware of the conveyancing process. And solicitors provide expert evidence in relation to that. So when you're writing your mock proctor article, bear in mind that you're writing to an educated legal audience, but one that does not necessarily know what's involved in conveyancing. And I hate to say it, but there is a risk that some lawyers who don't know much about conveyancing may think of it as being primarily procedural, you know, and if you're buying a block of land, it's a bit like buying a loaf of bread. So um, 
what you need to do in this article is say there are some issues associated with conveyancing that are perhaps not what you might expect. And um, your task is to draw out some problems that might arise for clients, buyers or sellers when undertaking a conveyancing transaction. Always remember that your solutions need to be provided with ethical considerations in mind. And there's always issues to do with ethics and conveyancing as there are other areas of practice. Have a look carefully at the rubric. I do follow the rubric when I'm marking. So you'll have a better understanding from that rubric as to what I think is appropriate when considering this um, response. Now, there's a 1400 word limit on this exercise. And you might think that's very specific, 1400. Now, the reason I chose that is that if you look at the guidelines for a Proctor article, I think that's the number they recommend as the maximum for, if you like, a substantial Proctor piece. They don't want you to write any more than that. So as you're doing your reading, I want you to firmly keep in mind any hiccups, problems, checks on the pavement type deals, that you may come across and think would be relevant in terms of explaining the potential hiccups, problems that might be associated for buyers or sellers. Now, you can make all of your problems relate to things that are relevant for buyers. You can make them all relevant for sellers. You can make a hybrid between the two. You can have some of your problems that relate to residential conveyancing. Others might be um, off the plan development contracts, others might be commercial contracts. So I'm not too concerned about the perspective, but I'm really keen for you to undertake your reading in a critical sense so that you're not just reading the words, you're thinking about the caravan in the backyard and the problems that might arise in the context of the reading. I hope that makes sense. All right, are there any questions about the first assessment what I want you to provide for me, the timing of the assessment, anything at all? It can be all good. Are we all good? I have the thumbs up. I'll move on. All right. So Bronwyn says, yeah, let's move on. Okay. All good. Second assessment. What day is that due? <clears throat> oh, there's a question from Jeff. In terms of formatting, does the reference, the footnotes need to be part of the article or just in the footnotes. Look, I would adopt the attitude of always using the AGLC when writing any material. It may not appear that way in the in Proctor articles, but I think Proctor articles actually do follow the um, Australian Guide to Legal Citations. So please do that in terms of um, what you produce for me to consider. I hope that answers your question, Jeff. All right, so second. 20 September. Everyone agree with that? So we've got the 20th of September firmly in mind and we know the same rules apply in relation to the uh, submission of that work as was the case for the um, first assessment. Let me now have a look at the, well I won't actually call it up on the screen. We'll talk more about this later. Uh, this is an advice. We're dealing with a factual scenario if you've worked with me in the past, you know that I like this type of question. And pretty much always, you are a first year lawyer. You're pretty much always working for the firm of Brown, Jones and Smith, which is a large Queensland based firm. And almost always you're working with a partner. It's usually Margaret. And uh, in this case, Margaret is your supervising partner has had you sit in on an interview and you've taken some notes, some issues have arisen and you need to provide an advice. All right, um, so bear in mind, read carefully what the advice requires you to deal with and know your audience for the advice. So I'll get you to read that, but I think it's always a good idea to read the assessments right from the start. Are there any questions about the second assessment? Don't worry, we'll be talking more about the assessments as we progress. But my main purpose in raising these issues is that you're firmly aware of how much the assessment is worth, 
when it's due, what the word count is, and what you need to start thinking about now as you do your reading. So I would have a skeleton answer for each of these, for both assessments, up on your screen, ready to go, as you're doing your reading. Something occurs to you, jot it down in the context of a potential answer, so that you're not looking at a blank screen the day before the assessment is due, and then thinking, how am I going to populate this? Do this progressively. It'll make it much easier, much more enjoyable, much less stress. Okay, are we doing okay so far? No questions? We've all got the textbook, and I would encourage you to do reading in advance. Don't just do the reading for the week. Try and read uh, in advance. It's a bit like statutory interpretation, where I think you want to get the overall picture um, and then come down and narrow down in terms of the requirements. The supplementary text is Principles of Land Contracts and Options, which is very good, but not as critical by any means as the prescribed text. So if you're only going to buy one, definitely go for the um, prescribed text. All right, now who knows what we mean by PEXA, P-E-X-A? Me. Yes, Bronwyn, would, would you like to tell us about it? Uh, yeah, it's a form of online conveyancing where you um, actually do your settlements online for, oh, well, um, uh, with the banks, you um, have to add the other solicitor as a, as a party to the transaction and you do all your documents online and you lodge and everything settles, the money transfers collectively and uh, all at the same time and it actually registers on the title that day straight away. So, All right, thank you very much. And this all came about as the introduction of national legislation in 2013. So if you see or read something about PEXA, then please take particular note. And um, it may be that there will be some real teething problems as we roll this out. And there have already been some teething problems. And soon I'll show you a photograph and see who knows their social media can tell me who it is. And then I'll tell you the problem associated with the conveyance that was written about last week for this particular person. Um, in terms of the text, there is some good material about PEXA. Have a look at uh, page 374 onwards for some detailed information about PEXA. It's in chapter seven, I think. So that is an example of where you need to read ahead. Okay, so be aware of PEXA. Have a look at um, uh, this progressive rollout of the electronic conveyancing system in Queensland and throughout the nation. And thank you, Bronwyn, for your contribution there. I appreciate that. So we now know that when we talk about the REOQ contracts, we're talking about what is effectively the standard contract. And I have reproduced with the authority of the REIQ and Law Society, the standard contracts, at least as they were until the 30th of June last year, uh, sorry, 30th of June this year. I will try to source the more up-to-date 15th version of the standard uh, house and land contract as it comes out. But on the Law Society material, there is some useful updates. And in that regard, let me um, see if I can retrieve from what I have on my other screen, some information that could be useful to you. Again, I'll share the screen and I want to highlight the importance of referring to, for example, the Queensland Law Society for information that will be relevant to conveyancing. So here we have an article on the Queensland Law Society website dated the 27th of June that provides information about updates to standard REOQ property sale contracts. The reason I'm showing you this is that whilst the text and whilst the study guide refer to additions as they were two years ago, I do expect you to be aware of and where possible use the up-to-date materials. So having information from the Queensland Law Society in terms of updates is excellent material. And you can see there that there's a reference to a High Court decision from 2018 with reference to Clause 7.7e. So if you have a question where 
Clause 7.7e is relevant, then referring to the High Court case you know, would provide you with an opportunity to get some excellent marks. Also with the Law Society, we have a comparison table. Dated the 22nd of June, we have a, co a comparison of the 11th versus the 12th edition of the contracts. Now that's going back to 2016. That provides you with some information that might assist you in terms of um, comparative tables and try to source if you can more up-to-date comparisons than that. And if you do succeed, please, please share that with us through Ucrew. Much more up-to-date, we have the President's update dated the 4th of July. All of this publicly accessible through the QLS website. And in that instance, the President is talking about e-conveyancing, saying that it's not mandatory in Queensland, only a tiny portion are going through electronically, but it is, it's got to be the way of the future. So best if we are studying conveyancing that you keep that firmly in mind. You might want to access more than just the publicly available material through the Queensland Law Society. What I would urge you to consider is becoming a member of the Queensland Law Society through their student membership program. And you'll see here under clause two, application for student membership. I would urge you to complete that, send it off. As I recall, it's free. Um, in fact, can I ask, is anyone a student member of the QLS already? If you're working in a law firm, you might have access through the law firm. So Mel, yes, Andrea, Mel, that's great. Okay. Do you find that worthwhile as a resource? Oh, it was $20, said Mel, sorry. Is it a worthwhile resource, do you think? I think it provides you with access to the up-to-date contracts and all sorts of things. Lots of info, email updates. Yeah, I get email updates as well from the Law Society. Um, so I'm, I'm now part of the Bar Association, but I still subscribe to and receive material from QLS. So really worthwhile. I'd urge you to consider doing that, particularly for conveyancing, because conveyancing is such a solicitor oriented um, uh, area of practice that the QLS has some excellent material. The other thing that you might want to consider if, uh, is looking at the Queensland Conveyancing Protocol. This provides a, a guide to what a solicitor should do in terms of care and skill of a reasonably competent and diligent solicitor. That's in to do with the conveyancing process. So if you're unsure about the ethics, the procedures, what is required of a solicitor, what if you like constitutes best practice, then I think it's imperative that you attempt to look at the conveyancing protocol. I am trying to source a copy of the protocol um, by getting the copyright. I'm working on that now and hopefully we'll have that for you. But the Law Society and the ROQ have said this to me, that, uh, sorry, Lexon have said to me, uh, and I'll explain Lexon in a moment, but Lexon have said to me, look, we'll give you access to all of our risk tool analysis and materials, some of which I've reproduced on Moodle already. Uh, you can, under the same rules, uh, we will also allow you to upload the conveyancing protocol. So if someone has the protocol, provided we follow the rules set out uh, from Lexon, we can upload that. So please feel free to send it on or provide it through um, through Ucrew. Now I've got to note my internet connection is unstable. I hope that you can hear me reasonably clearly. All good? Let's take a break for a moment in the sense of, does anyone have any questions or comments, anything that we need to cover? All good so far? All right. I mentioned Lexon. Who knows what Lexon is? L-E-X-O-N. I'll give you hints to do with insur legal insurer. You see what I'm doing here? I'm subtly trying to draw out information about who works in the conveyancing field. So I'm getting an idea of who might be in the conveyancing field from some of these answers. They're the legal insurers. On the website for Moodle, I have produced some material that I've sourced from Lexon. It does come with um, a requirement that you respect the, conf the copyright nature of the material. So you'll see that in terms of the Lexon material that I've provided, 
They're not to be released to outside parties, educational purposes only. And I must notify you of certain things in terms of Lexon expressly disclaiming liability and responsibility in certain um, ways. And all of that, uh, those disclosures are formally put out on the website. So please look at those disclosures and use the materials that we provide uh, via Moodle from Lexon responsibly and please uh, commit to the um, uh, copyright uh, obligations that they've imposed on me, which I now impose on you. In other words, if something goes wrong, it comes back on me and I don't want it to come back on me. Have we got a deal? Is that all good? All right, thank you. Which is a nice little segue, if you like, into ethical duties in conveyancing practice. Um, ethical duties are a part of all legal practice, but you know they they really are prominent when it comes to conveyancing. So, one of the things that you need to consider: whatever answer you provide, whatever material is, what are your obligations under the Legal Profession Act of two thousand seven? Are you acting in a professionally appropriate manner? Um, and Lexon is not just for conveyancing, it's for lawyers in general. So good question there, Mel. Thank you. So have a look at section 227 of the Legal Profession Act, which deals with the definition of unsatisfactory professional conduct and professional misconduct. Now, the reason I'm raising this with you right at the start is this. Every answer you give Every action that you take, if you're acting in conveyancing transactions, you must ask yourself, am I acting appropriately or is what I'm doing tantamount to acting in an unprofessional, unsatisfactory professional manner or am I committing professional misconduct? There's a lot of scope for these sorts of questions to be raised in conveyancing. You also need to consider and apply the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules of 2012 and you need to understand and apply appropriately issues to do with undertakings. There's some very good material on QLS about undertakings. And I've got a video which I did a couple of years ago about undertakings. I'll see if I can dig it out and upload it onto Moodle. All right, so can I take it that we all know how to find the Legal Profession Act? We all know how to find the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules. And we all know how to find our way to the Queensland Law Society website. If not, please let me know now or ask through you crew, and I'm sure that we'll all be happy to help each other. So what other, apart from the Legal Profession Act, here are some of the acts that you'll need to be aware of. You probably no need to write this down. It, it'll be in the textbook, but the Land Title Act, the Property Occupations Act, the Agents Financial Administration Act, Body Corporate and Community Management Act, the Property Law Act, Neighbourhood Disputes Dividing Fences and Trees Act, the Stamp Act, Foreign Acquisitions and Takeovers, which is Commonwealth, the Planning Act 2016, which used to be the Sustainable Planning Act, so the contract that has just been superseded was actually out of date on that point. The Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, which is Commonwealth, and I mentioned already the Legal Profession Act. Okay, <clears throat> um, quick quiz. I'm going to find a picture and just want to see if anyone recognises. I don't recognise this person, but um, see if you do. I'll just share the screen. I, I'm not me. I'm not trying to be disrespectful in showing you this photo. Far from it. Um, but this was part of the media on the 29th of June. All right. Now, does anyone know who one of those people is? I'm just looking on the chat facility to see if any answers come through. Apparently, a Master Chef finalist. So, so did someone get that right? Yes. Okay. That's it. Master Chef, so Bronwyn knew. Um, so I don't watch that show, but um, the reason I'm showing you that is that um, 
have you heard what happened to her and her family? It was really unfortunate. And it was to do with the new e-conveyancing process. Um, she was unfortunate. Her family were victims of fraud. Yes, Bronwyn, a PEXA problem. Do you know what happened, Bronwyn? Uh, yes, their money got, um, <coughs> their conveyance um, email got hacked and um, a email was sent to them with their bank account details and um, they forwarded like half of their settlement money from their sale of their house to this non uh, un, non conveyances account, and uh, half of their money was stolen. But Pexa had ended up um, stumping up the money, and now now changed their guidelines so that that doesn't happen again. Thank you very much. That's great. Yeah, no, I, I see it was um, Master Chef finalist uh, Danny Venn and her husband. All right, so part of the reason for showing you that is that this is all very new. We're coming in at a pretty exciting, interesting time. Unfortunately, there is the opportunity for people to try to exploit the system through fraud, and um, uh, Ms. Van and her family were victims of that fraud. So when you're undertaking your reading, please keep out an eye out for that. If you have an opportunity to include up-to-date materials, case law or other information, please do so in your assessment pieces. If you find something interesting that others might be interested in, please share it. We don't have a participation mark for this unit as such, but I really do encourage you to help each other. And the idea of Ucrew is for you to share information so you're not just relying on me to provide information and being responsive to it. May I ask a favour, if you haven't been into Ucrew and you're in Moodle now, could you just click on the link and see if you get through? Those of you that have never been into Ucrew, just go to the link now on Moodle, click on it, see if it takes you there. I mean, it does for me, go straight through but I'd be interested if anyone can say, yes, that worked or no, that didn't work. Just let me know on the chat facility. And I promise this is the last thing we'll do tonight. Then we'll have a break. Everyone doing that? Finding their way to you, crew? Yes, right, so we're getting some worked. Great, all right. So there's not a lot of magic in it. Just go on, type in, hey, hi, give us some background. If you like, introduce yourself, provide something that you think is interesting, an article, a case, some sort of material. So what, do we, what can we take from tonight? And we're just about to wrap up. The first is that conveyancing is potentially pretty exciting. I found that out in my first week and that was confirmed in my first couple of months. There are a lot of things that can go wrong in conveyancing, and the first place that we always need to look is the contract. Make sure that you're aware of the assessment pieces and work towards that now. Don't leave working on the assessments to the week before. Know what you have to achieve, and as you read material, start to build your responses to the assessments now. And Bronwood said, conveyancing is stressful. I take my hat off to conveyances. Anyone who does conveyancing, I think, does a wonderful job. It is a really tough job. I'd much rather be a litigator. <laughs> That's why I'm a litigator, not a conveyancer. I, I wouldn't be able to handle it. All it's right. Terrible. <laughs> it's hard work. It's really hard work. Clients ask for extensions and then the other side doesn't grant them. Like I know. Today. All oh those sorts God. of things. So <laughs> all that sort of stuff. All right. Look, it's been great to meet you tonight. Thank you very much. I'll let you go and watch the football or have a cup of tea or whatever it is that you're about to do. And um, we'll see you next week. All the best. Bye then.